It's been one day since Donald Trump pleaded not guilty in federal criminal court in Miami. Six days ago, when word broke of the indictment, the majority of the reaction from those in his party sought to blame the Justice Department and the sitting president. Some rivals even talked about offering Trump a pardon. Since then, others, including high-profile voices in the party, have focused on the seriousness of the charges against the president. And some Republicans have tried to hold both positions. CBS News chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa has the latest on the aftermath of the indictment. As former President Trump continues to falsely claim that President Biden is directing cases for the Justice Department. Crooked Joe Biden's weaponized Department of Injustice. Attorney General Merrick Garland today defended appointing special counsel Jack Smith and touted his department's independence. As I said when I appointed uh, Mr. Smith, I did so because it underscores the Justice Department's commitment to both independence and accountability. One day after the historic arraignment on charges, including illegally hoarding classified documents at his Florida estate, Trump and his legal team are arguing he was allowed to take the documents after leaving the White House. Under the Presidential Records Act, which is civil, not criminal, I had every right to have these documents. It's an absolute right. This is the law. But according to the National Archives, the Presidential Records Act requires that all records created by presidents be turned over to the National Archives at the end of their administrations. Legal scholars say the Trump team's assertion will likely not fare well in court. The reason why this argument is so hard to make that these are personal records and not presidential records or agency records is because they're classified documents on their face. They're literally created by another agency with classified information. On the campaign trail, some Republicans now say Trump can defend himself. I can't defend what is alleged in this indictment, but the president's entitled to his day in court. And Robert Costa joins me now. Bob, there's a growing group of former Trump allies now expressing concern about the allegations. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is the latest I saw, and some rivals in the, for the Republican nomination are modifying their positions as uh, we just saw from the former vice president there in your piece. So what are you hearing behind the scenes? Uh, is there this shift big and real, or is it just small? It seems, based on my reporting, John, to be pretty small. I mean, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, he commands a profile in the national security and the foreign policy community, but he decided not to run for the Republican nomination this time around. And so many of the voices that are speaking out are those who are not in the race for president. There are people on the sidelines, respectfully. And what we're seeing right now is a Republican Party that's still grappling with how to deal with this historic indictment. Trump is someone who's plowing ahead, raising more than $6 million, according to his campaign, since he was indicted. And his rivals are looking at this, and as we've discussed for weeks, believing they have kind of a wait-and-see moment, wondering if he's going to get indicted in Georgia, wondering how this all plays out in the federal court in Florida, but still not sure the political future here, because Trump again and again has rebounded from these kind of investigations. What do you make, Bob, of the uh, entrance, entrance of Francis Suarez, the uh, Republican mayor of Miami, uh, into the fray at, at this point? Like a lot of Republicans around the country, he senses a bit of a soft political underbelly for Trump right now, that maybe Trump is vulnerable, if not this summer, down the line in the fall, if Republican voters start to get frustrated and tired of all the investigations, the litigation. And he's jumping in because there's really no cost to running at this point in American politics. If you're a mayor of a major city like Miami or even a mayor of a, a city like South Bend, Indiana, which I went to college there at Notre Dame, this is a, uh, a, an American political system that if you have enough of a social media profile and an ability to get on the debate stage and generate momentum, on television, then you can create a bit of a political space for yourself in the country. If not land on the ticket, maybe in the cabinet, or give yourself some kind of a stature that could provide you political capital. Let me ask you a last question, Bob. When there are these big moments in national politics, uh, we all naturally pay attention to them. But um, you and I have spent some time in small rooms with just a dozen people and these candidates. That work is all still going on. Give us a piece of that. Um, what other candidates, what's going on in the spade work of politics to run for the presidency that we're not focused on because these bright lights are over covering this indictment? I think that's such an important point, John. I was just in Iowa with former Vice President Mike Pence, and to me, he's a sleeper candidate 
in this race. I'm not saying he's going to be the nominee, but he could be the nominee. I still believe, based on reporting and talking to voters in Iowa and elsewhere, that there could be a late break for one contender or two contenders in this field as the Republican voters start to pay close attention. And Pence is out there talking to evangelical voters, religious voters, conservatives, and saying, I'm one of you. I'm from the Midwest. Give me a chance. I'll enact the Trump agenda without the drama. That's essentially his pitch. And if you think about Pence, if he goes to farm after farm, town hall after town hall in Iowa, that's a lot like what Mike Huckabee did, what Ted Cruz did, what Rick Santorum did. So there is a playbook, even in the, the, the land of bright lights in American presidential politics, to do it the small ball way and maybe have a shot. I'm going to ask you that question about 50 times, maybe more, between now and the voting. Robert Costa, thank you so much in Washington. Thank you. Thank you. And now there's even more legal trouble for the former president. A Manhattan judge on Tuesday granted E. Jean Carroll's request to revise her defamation suit against Donald Trump to include comments he made about her after he lost a separate civil suit that she had brought against him for sexual abuse. He was ordered to pay $5 million in that case. Carroll is now seeking another $10 million for defamation. Carroll, who was suing Trump separately for defamation, has now upped that amount. 